Hello and welcome to another segment of In the Green. I'm your host Susan Fawcett. I'm here today with David Cobb, the Green presidential candidate, and also Melissa Hohauser Thatcher, the recently elected school board member who's a Green in Ferndale, Michigan. And we're just going to expand the dialogue a little bit to local issues and talk about education and what a green education means. Well, Susan, thank you. And it's a real honor to be here with Melissa as a green office holder, proving that greens don't just have ideas, greens are not just candidates, but we're elected we, officials. We are. We're elected <laughs> officials. You know, Melissa, uh, on the campaign trail, when people ask me about education, I often make the broad observation that the most important thing that children learn how to do is how to walk and how to talk. And sadly, our current educational system, as corporatized as it is, the, most, the first thing they're taught is sit down and shut up. Oh, absolutely. And I think that's one of the biggest problems with the education system right now. Uh, I see it in my son all the time, this willingness to learn and creativity, and it's squelched, basically, at, at school. And they're there a long time. They're there eight hours a day for nine months. Um, that's a lot of time that they're not at home with their parents. I mean, if you're a green um, and you're, you're looking at public education and wanting it to change, uh, it's kind of frightening when you think about your child being with somebody else for that amount of time during and the day. You know, I want to make it very clear that for myself and for the Green Party, we are not opponents of public education. No, no. Far from it. We're adamant supporters. And in fact, I do not blame public school teachers at all. Mm -mm. Uh, we're grateful to public school teachers for what they do. But the reality is the system is designed to prevent teachers from being able to really unleash their creativity and to really help to create the space where that kind of exploring and learning takes place. Because our system is not designed to provoke thoughtful, critical thinking. Right. Our system is designed to teach obedience, to produce consumers, workers, workers <laughs> and soldiers, right. rather than critical thinking citizens in this country. And I see it all the time with public school teachers. Oh, I do too. And you, and you hear that from public school teachers that they want to use their creativity and they want to be doing things in the classroom and they don't get the support. And right. it's not necessarily um, the administration or parents, it's just no support system at all for these teachers to run with an idea. We in Ferndale have an open classroom program um, and also a multi-age classroom program. Oh, wow. So two different magnet programs, but even those programs don't get the support. And part of that, I think, is because of uh, the sort of over overarching idea that um, making critical thinkers is a little scary to the status quo. I mean, so I, I see a little bit even in our own district um, wanting to put as many strictures on that open classroom, open classroom program right. as possible. <laughs> and so you start asking yourself, is it really open? Right. You know, I think it's important to understand that the Green Party's program from the, from the big picture is we need to empower local communities to make their decisions about education, Absolutely. about curriculum, and let teachers and parents and local communities make those decisions. The Green Party really believes in local control. But I'll tell you this, as a presidential candidate, I am proud to call for a massive infusion of dollars into the school systems in this yes. country. We need to pay teachers more money. Mm -hmm. And you know what? There's plenty of money to go around. How about this for a, a tax system? Let's tax the super rich, cut hundreds of billions of dollars from the military really? budget, <laughs> and make that available to our school system. Exactly. What do you think? I'm, I'm all for that. <laughs> I think our district would be really happy with that program. Um, I know that, that um, money's important. I mean, money's important yes. to the schools. You have to have safe buildings, you have to have playground equipment. I mean, there, there are things that cost a lot of money that, that you have to be thinking about, but even not having those dollars, there are ways to, to get a green education by giving support to those teachers, right. by giving support to the parents. Um, com you know, with, with community schooling, when the whole community's involved, and everybody's um, working toward a better school, it makes a, a huge difference. Fantastic. Well, you know, Melissa, I'm really excited to, to be talking to you. You know, there are 207 elected Greens across <laughs> the country. And so I'd like to ask you, as a Green elected office holder, really, what was it that drew you into the Green Party? And how was it that you came to decide, you know, I'm just going to go beyond talking about things to actually run and get elected as a candidate? Well, it, I don't want to put the chicken before the egg sort of thing, but uh, I have always considered myself green in the sense that my views, who I am, you know, and who I was raised to be by my parents who are also um, very progressive, uh, all of the issues I agreed with. I'd just never been 
you know, <laughs> at a Green Party meeting, and that, I didn't really know many Greens. And you know, we, Melissa, for me, when, when I read the Green Party uh, 10 key values, I said, how about that? I never knew. Oh, I'm a Green. That's exactly what I did, too. <laughs> I read that, and I'm like, I never had a home. <laughs> it's kind of like living in Ferndale. I, I live in Ferndale now, and I never felt like I had a home till I lived there. I really, in, you know, really love my community. But um, there were a bunch of disgruntled parents, and I was one of them, and we were upset by the fact that the community didn't have a say in what was going on in our schools, and we send our children there. And so we, we went to the greenhouse in Ferndale and spoke with some people there, and they were like, let's go. And I was <laughs> like, here's my money. I'm a member. I'm a green member. I want to do this, and I want to get elected. And it happened. Fantastic. But it wasn't, you know, it wasn't easy. It was walking door to door and talking to people and discussing, you know, green issues, school issues, and, uh, and we did it. And we Fantastic. won by over, I think, 100, over 100 votes, which felt really good. Out of how many votes cast? Uh, I think that there were, I had like 600 and some, and my, the woman I ran with had 700 and some. Fantastic. So we didn't have a huge turnout, but we had the right turnout. All right. <laughs> and the right result. <laughs> exactly. So, but it was a lot of work, and it was, it wasn't advertising, and it wasn't flashy signs, and it wasn't attacking your opponents. It was talking to the people about what matters to them, right. which is a public education system that they have a part in, that they feel comfortable sending their kids there, and you know that's really what most of the people, at least in our community, wanted. Fantastic. They want people to listen. So. Right. Which just goes to show that the Green Party people can get elected. And you know, folks, if you're watching and engaged by this conversation, I'm going to make a personal appeal to you, just like Melissa did, just like I did. You take a look at the Green Party at M-I-G-R-E-E-N-S dot O-R-G, the Michigan Green Party, and I would not be surprised if you too are a Green and you don't yet know it. <laughs> so find out about the only political party that's calling for peace, racial and social justice, real democracy, and environmental protection. You might be a Green too. Absolutely. All right. So I think we are going to welcome another a guest on to the show. I'd like to welcome Art Myatt, who's our next guest. He's running right now as a Green for Oakland County Executive against Brooke Patterson, who is a conservative Republican. There is no Democrat in the race. Hey, Art. How are you? It's a pleasure to meet you. Good. Good to meet you. Well, Art, I'm just curious to find out how it is that you came to be running for uh, County Executive here. Well, the uh, reason that I'm running for this specific office is because the Democrats, for some reason, chose not to run an opponent. Now. Oakland County is a fairly large county. It's a population of 1.2 million people. It's bigger in population than seven of the states. And the Democrats chose not to run an opponent. So Brooks was going to get a free pass unless there was an opponent. Well, what is it that you're running on? What are the issues that your campaign, your Green Party campaign, is focusing on? Well, I'm focusing on uh, a role that the county could take in uh, protecting the environment. That's one. The, uh, the county, because it's, uh, it's keeping track of records, it's keeping track of infrastructure and so on, has a uh, geographic information system that's uh, very well computerized. And Oakland County actually has a geographic information system that's very advanced. I want to make use of that, since it already exists for these other purposes, uh, to keep track of pollution information, mm -hmm. not necessarily by spending millions going out, the county government spending millions going out to make the measurements itself, but simply by consolidating the information that's already out there. The EPA has made measurements, Michigan State University has made measurements, uh, other organizations have already made measurements, and as long as it's good scientific data uh, about uh, type and amount of pollution in Oakland County, I don't mind where it comes from, and I would even invite organizations like the Sierra Club to make measurements about uh, mercury in the water that they're concerned with and um, well gosh that sounds put the information on that just sounds like good government to me <laughs> <laughs> well it's it's something that isn't being done now uh, surprise surprise so well that's one issue uh, are there any others that you're deciding to focus on in your campaign well one of the issues that's very big for democracy the uh, general budget for the county is 
upwards of $300 million. Uh, very few people are aware of how the money's being spent. It's a lot that, of money. That's, that's, just the, that's just the general fund budget. There's also special fund budgets uh, about equal to that. But those are uh, taxes that are assigned, for instance, to the drain commissioner for drainage districts. Mm -hmm. um, on top of that, there's an additional couple of agencies, the Oakland County Road Commission and the um, Oakland County Mental Health Authority, which are not run by elected officials. They're run by appointed officials. And those two agencies have a combined budget also upwards of $300 million. But the people running them never have to answer to the public in an election. So one of the things that I want to work on is changing the structure of the government to make those two agencies elected officials. I don't particularly want those under the control of the executive. It's not a grab for power before I have any. <laughs> Uh, I would like to see those agencies uh, run by elected officials. That sounds like a good uh, proposal for making government more accountable and more responsible for, to the citizens who live here in this community. Uh, I certainly hope so. And uh, one of the things that I've noticed, uh, most of the county is covered by cable TV. Most of the residents of the county have cable TV or could have it. And every little city has their city government channel but there's no county government channel. <laughs> so city council meetings where people are arguing about a row of parking meters and an expenditure of a couple of thousand dollars here and there, those are televised, but something about the Oakland County Airport, which recently, the Oakland County Airport happens to be the, the second busiest airport in Michigan. It's owned by Oakland County government. And they decided to relocate a road, obliterate several acres of wetlands, cut down a bunch of trees that were a sound barrier for people living near the airport. Uh, they did a lot of things wrong, and it only got attention after the fact. Right. People were complaining about it after the fact. You did this wrong, you did that wrong, but unfortunately it's done now. Uh, I would really like to see a county government channel so that people could be aware of what's being planned, what's being discussed, and so that people would be motivated to have some kind of say about it if they don't like it. Well, you know, Art, that it sounds like, like another example of creative thinking about how to make local government better and more accountable and responsible to the citizens. I'm wondering, for you, what brought you into the Green Party and what made you decide to run for this particular office? Well, running for this particular office, like I said, was, was just that there was going to be no opposition unless somebody stepped to do it, and I thought it may as well be a green. All right. I like the way that sounds. But as to what brought me into the Green Party, uh, I'd have to go back a while. Uh, 1986, uh, my son, who was six years old at the time, came down with leukemia. and. He died when he was 10, so for four years I was fighting the health insurance system. I was fighting for coverage to get treatment for him. I actually had pretty good insurance. As a matter of fact, I had Blue Cross insurance, which is supposed to be, that's supposed to be the best. It is. But they didn't want to cover a bone marrow transplant. They said it wasn't cost effective. Um, he, had, he had no chance of living without it, but as far as they were concerned, it wasn't cost effective. Oh my. So uh, a few years after we buried him, uh, I had a lot to think about, and I, I ended up becoming active in Michigan for universal health care. It's the Michigan chapter of the Universal Healthcare Access Network. Yes. Uh, so I became active in that for quite a while, uh, and I still am active in that, but when the Nader campaign came along in 2000, uh, and Universal Healthcare was part of that campaign, that made me aware that here was a party that agreed with <laughs> at least some of the issues that I had already definitely made my mind up about. Right. 
And, and let's and remember thought, that there are hundreds of millions of Americans, literally the majority of Americans already support the idea right. of universal health care, but there are no politicians getting elected at the congressional level who are supporting it. That's unfortunately true. There are a few politicians who talk about it. Right. And who support it on some level, but that never seems to get any traction. Right. It never seems to get past the lobbyists. But uh, first time to run for office. Uh, no, I actually uh, uh, did a very awkward job of trying to run for state representative in uh, in 2002. Is that uh, right? I got some votes, but uh, I'm I'm not really I'm not really cut out in some way to be a candidate. I, I got along for decades without being a candidate. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm having, to, I'm having to learn a lot. I was very shy about asking people for money. Now I take Visa, MasterCard, and Discover on my website. Right. I'm not shy about asking people for money now. Uh, You're doing the goddess's own work without money, Art. How can you be shy? We are doing the most important work that any human being could be doing in the state of the current crisis. So don't be embarrassed as a Green Party candidate for ask for money. Be excited to ask for money. Well, what I'm saying is in 2002, I waited until about a week before the election to send out a general fundraising appeal, <laughs> which was far too late to have any effect. Um, I, I learned a lot. From, from that experience. I got 875 votes. It wasn't, it wasn't much, but I learned from it. All right. Well, and, uh, on that note, I think it's time to bring on our next guest. Hi there. We're here with Lisa Weltman, who's running for U.S. Congress in the 14th District. Hi, Lisa. Hi. I'm Hi. so glad you're here. Well, Lisa, why don't, I, I'm just curious. Tell us, you're running for the United States Congress as a Green Party uh, person. Tell us what can, what's your campaign about. What are you running on? Well, my campaign is about particularly empowerment of people, and by empowerment I don't mean um, individuals go out and get rich and start small businesses. I mean empowering our communities to struggle for ourselves. Uh, the main campaign slogans that I'm running under are uh, peace, democracy, and employment. Um, talk a lot about those things. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, I, I, I'd like to talk about the first one you mentioned, peace, mm -hmm. because the Green Party as a peace party, uh, the current war in Iraq and the occupation is something that I'm adamantly opposed to. As a mm -hmm. congressional candidate, uh, let's talk about what you would be doing when you get the opportunity to vote in the United States Congress. Well, the first thing that I would do in the United States Congress is to call for an immediate withdrawal of all troops from Iraq, from Afghanistan. Um, I would also support a program of reparations for the damage that's been done. I think that the reparations should be financed out of the assets of the companies that profited out of this war in the first place. Bechtel, companies like that. Don't forget Halliburton. Oh, absolutely. Let's make sure Halliburton is on that <laughs> absolutely. list. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Um, so pulling, pulling the troops out immediately and repairing the damage. Of course, it's got to be under the control of the people who live in that country who mm -hmm. live in those countries who've been damaged, democratic control, their decisions on what happens and how it happens. You know, really, Lisa, is desc you're describing, and Susan, what we in the Green Party are talking about, are really a new paradigm in how to even think about U.S. foreign policy mm -hmm. and in global relations whatsoever, right? Right. It's exciting. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm also a socialist and have been for many, many years, and this is something that I've believed in for for many, many years, and I'm very, very happy to see us coming together like this on, on this type of a program. Fantastic. Uh, and why did you choose the Green Party to run then? Well, because I, I very much agree, uh, appreciate the Green Party's commitment to democracy. Um, as you know, ballot access is a very difficult thing in Michigan. We're one of the most difficult um, states to win ballot access in. The requirements are just absolutely ridiculous. and, and any third party has to has have three times the number of votes or three times the number of petition signatures as a Democrat or a Republican. Um, and so, I mean, this is not a democratic system that we have here. But the Green Party has, has put forward opportunities as long as we agree on certain key principles. Um, and I was so pleased to find that there are principles that, that we both agree on. I think we should be doing a lot of that, right. a, lot of, a lot of working. So I'm, so I'm both. 
I'm both. I'm a green and I'm a socialist. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, it's interesting because we talk about democracy, and you've mentioned mm -hmm. democracy several times. You know, the word democracy means the people rule. And the reality is the most dangerous threat to democracy in this country is the mistaken belief that we actually have one. The reality is unelected and unaccountable corporate CEOs are making the fundamental public policy decisions in this country. We are not ruling. We the people are not ruling in this country. You know, and I think that it's important for Greens as candidates to tell the truth and to actually accurately describe the situation we're in, the looming ecological catastrophe, uh, the crisis mm -hmm. in democracy, you know, the, the oppression that, that is all around us, and to demonstrate that there is a plan, there is a solution, there is a way out of it. Yes. One of the things that I'm working on right now is a voter defense drive. I think one of the key important issues is that we've never had true democracy. You can't have, for example, freedom of the press if the majority of the people can't afford to publish. Right. Um, the, the press yeah. is only free to the people who actually own it. Mm -hmm. if you, it's freedom for those who have enough money. Yes. Um, but there's another thing that's been happening as well. Like the last election was stolen. People like to blame, you know, blame Nader or blame other people. But that's not really the case. George Bush stole that last election, and he's going to try to do it again. Um, I have friends who've worked on the, um, the uh, electronic voting machines issues. Um, we've seen a lot of attempts. But the election was sto stolen, particularly by denying African American voters in mass the right to vote. Over 100,000 African Americans were intentionally, illegally disenfranchised seven months before the election. Even in my neighborhood, in one of our elections, we went out to the polls and we saw police officers stopping, particularly black women who were going to vote, stopping and harassing them. You can't park here, you can't, and, and following them around the street. It was, it was intimidation tactics. So what, we're, what I'm working on now also is a campaign to defend the polls. We hear that the Republican Party is going to send out people to harass voters in our neighborhoods and around the country. Uh, we have Republican politicians talking about the need to suppress the Detroit vote, uh, which, is, which is atrocious. So we're going to go out to the polls this year and we're going to celebrate democracy. And we're going to have groups of people celebrating. And if somebody tries to harass anybody, we're going to make sure that they have the right to vote in a way that they're not intimidated, they're not harassed. Boy, I like that idea, actually, a Green Party voter defense drive. Mm -hmm. Not just a voter registration drive, but a voter defense drive. Yes. Now, you had mentioned a couple of other uh, campaigns that you were running on. Do you want to talk a little bit more about your campaign, Lisa? Oh, sure, sure. Well, um, I particularly grew up in a very poor ba background economically you very and I, poor. You and right. I share that in common, right. actually. I'm not embarrassed at all to say that I grew up in poverty. I'm very proud to be a working class person. Uh, we make everything in this country. We, we do. We <laughs> run this country. That's and right. Say it again. Yeah, we, we run, run this, this country. country. <laughs> well, if we want to, we can also bring it to a stop if we have to do it. But um, what we need to realize is our power. We need to realize our power as a group, not as individuals. And so my campaign is, is about bringing people together on that basis. Um, the other key point that I'm running on is employment, jobs. And I'm calling for a massive public works program um, to rebuild our communities. I walk down the street and, and I see kids playing basketball on the street. And they've got foot and a half deep potholes. The, and you wonder how many of them have sprained their ankles on these potholes. Mm -hmm. um, down the, 500 feet down the street, there's, a, there's an abandoned lot. It could be turned into a park. And we could finance this type of thing by um, taking away corporate welfare. Now, the state of Michigan gives $16 billion a year in corporate welfare. $16 billion a year. I don't know if you know, um, in the state of Michigan, there are many, many areas that if you are a corporation who does international trade, you're allowed to declare your factory or your area to be foreign territory so that you can avoid, avoid import taxes. Right. It, it's atrocious, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So a public works program could provide job training, mm -hmm. education, rebuilding our neighborhoods. If we did away with Building a mass transit system in this absolutely. country, a train system. Mm -hmm. We have no train system in, in, in our city, in Detroit. 
rebuilding the trolley system that was destroyed by General Motors and Firestone mm -hmm. and uh, at, at, at the other auto and oil corporations. I mean, the reality is that the Green Party's vision uh, could be implemented sim quite simply. The money is available. Our tax plan is actually simple. Tax the super rich and make them pay their fair share mm -hmm. and cut the military budget, bloated as it is, by hundreds of billions of dollars. The money is available. Right. We just are not like, spending our money and investing our money wisely in the people. If we were to follow that program, we could stop laying off hundreds and hundreds of teachers. We could finance the school system three times over, finance uh, a public works program that would rebuild our communities, and still have money left over. That's true. I think we are running out of time. So David, if you have any last remarks. Well, yes, thank you so much, Susan. And Lisa, it was <laughs> such a pleasure to, to share you. this time mm -hmm. with you. Um, and I actually, I wanted to take this opportunity to speak directly uh, to the viewers of In the Green and to remind you that what you've been hearing us talk about in this program is real systemic change. Local level at the school board, county commissioner, and U.S. Congress, and myself running for president. And you know, remember that systemic change in this country has always come from alternative parties, so-called third parties. Think about it. The abolition of slavery, women getting the right to vote, creating the Social Security Administration, unemployment insurance, workers' compensation laws, pure food and drug laws, the end of child labor. The reality is the entire fabric of what everybody today would agree to be the bare, bare minimum for a just and compassionate society. Well, you know, that fabric was literally woven together by alternative parties before us. Alternative parties who were accused of being dangerous and un-American, uh, alternative parties who were accused of being naive and unrealistic, and alternative political parties who were accused of being spoilers. But you know, let's take a moment and acknowledge, appreciate, and really celebrate and be grateful that the people before us did not quit. They did not go away. They did not accept that they could, had to shut up. They did not accept that they were unrealistic or naive. They did not accept that they were un-American. They learned what we've learned, and that is that to, real make, to really make change, they had to create their own political party that would run candidates for office on their agenda. And because they were able to do that and had the courage and conviction to do it, they changed this country. So today, if you want to live in a society that will end war as foreign policy, if you want to live in a society that will repeal the Patriot Act and NAFTA and the World Trade Organization and the entire corporate managed trade system, if you want to live in a society where we the people were actu will actually create our own institutions that work for us, if you want to live in a society with universal health care, that a society that will raise the minimum wage to a living wage so that everyone can make enough money to live above the poverty level and live in dignity as a result of their work and their efforts. You see, if you want to live in that society, you got to be willing to vote for candidates who are articulating that agenda. That political party is the Green Party. My name is David Cobb. I'm the Green Party's candidate for President of the United States. Peace. Thanks for watching In the Green.